On June 7, 1996, The Phantom was released in theaters. At this time in history, Batman was pretty much the only viable comic book movie franchise around. But since Batman and all the other DC characters were tied up with Warner, and the Marvel heroes were neither proven properties nor particularly easy to bring to life on the screen, some studios experimented with other comic book characters from smaller publishers, or try to bring new life into the pulp era heroes, like the Rocketeer, the Shadow, and the Phantom. Despite whatever virtues these movies might have had though, none fared well at the box office at the time. While the Phantom movie, which we'll be talking about here, still has its fair share of fans, it was not to hit upon release. Today, 20 years later, probably most write it off as just another 90s comic book movie misfire. Is this a fair assessment, or is it true what some claim, that the movie was far ahead of its time? That is what I'll be looking into in this retrospective. To start it off, I will provide a brief plot synopsis of the movie, and some reasons why it might have flopped the way it did upon release way back in 1996. Then I'll share what my younger self thought of the movie at the time, and what I think of it now, 20 years later, and why my view might have changed. The film tells us the story of Kit Walker, the 21st Phantom, and his attempt to prevent rich madman Sander Drax from obtaining the skulls of Tuganda, as these will give him the secret to ultimate power and world domination. In the process of tracking down the skulls, the Phantom also encounters the man who killed his father years earlier, and the killer now serves as one of Drax's henchmen. The movie was written by Joe Dante and Jeffrey Bohm, who initially developed the movie as a spoof. Dante was originally set to direct, and Bruce Campbell was in talks to star, which makes perfect sense, as Campbell has both the chops for spoofs and the leading man qualities of the Pulp Era serials. However, Joe Dante bowed out of directing when the movie got pushed back for a year. The movie was instead helmed by Australian director Simon Windsor, who, as it happened, had been a fan of the Phantom since childhood. He was the one who cast Billy Zane as the lead, and he made the call to shoot the movie as a straight adventure, not as the spoof Dante had planned. But the movie was still written as a spoof, and while we don't know too many details, what is the production was a difficult one. The movie has two editors listed, and there are reports of numerous scenes left on the cutting room floor, so landing on a final theatrical cut would appear to have been a tumultuous process. Grossing only a total of 17 million domestically on a budget of 45 million, The Phantom was an instant flop. You can't dismiss that as because it sucked. Enough people need to see a given movie in the first place in order to warn others from seeing it before you can make that call. And this was before Twitter, word of mouth didn't spread as fast back then. Furthermore, the movie actually received some mixed to positive reviews at the time. No, when a movie bombs instantaneously like this, you have to look for other reasons why it didn't entice audiences to see it in the first place at all. Unlike Batman, Spider-Man, and the other big guns of comics, The Phantom isn't owned by any of the larger comic book houses like Marvel or DC, but by King Features, which specializes in licensing comic book strips and other material for newspapers around the world. While The Phantom has been in constant print in newspapers worldwide since the character's creation in 1936 up till today, a newspaper strip alone might not be a sufficient way of building a loyal audience and fan base for a character such as this. Internationally, The Phantom is far more popular than in the US quite possibly because of the availability of standalone Phantom comics and collections. In the Phantom's two biggest markets, the Nordic and Australia, the Phantom has been published non-stop in its own standalone comic since the middle of the last century. It is not the newspaper strips, but these comics, which outsell any and all DC and Marvel heroes that has built and sustained the audience in those territories. So how come the Phantom has a regular comic in the Nordic and Australia, but not in the US? Well, because in the Nordic, the Phantom is licensed to Egmont, and in Australia, to Fru. 
Both of these are major publishing houses, and The Phantom is their Batman and their Spider-Man rolled into one. The Phantom comic is published on a regular basis, and there is no shortage of collected editions. Furthermore, Egmont writes original Phantom stories, and these are published by Fru as well, which take place in and expand upon creator Lee Falk's original Phantom continuity. This is a marked contrast to the US, where the few Phantom comics that have been published in the past few decades were all other world's adventures, taking place outside of Lee Falk's canon. This might actually have been part of the challenge facing the movie in the US, as the numerous other world stories might have further diluted a brand not that well known in the first place. Unlike Batman, which is an institution, or Judge Dredd, which was sold as a Stallone vehicle, not that that helped, The Phantom was sold as exactly that, The Phantom, an adventure movie, but not many might have known what that entailed. The American comic book readers, the group that should have been the movie's built-in audience, didn't necessarily read the newspaper strip featuring their grandpa's hero. At the time, the American comic book readers would instead have been familiar with two very different incarnations of the Phantom. The first, the DC-licensed Phantom, was a short-lived, dark, depressing, and sorry affair. The second, which would have been known far outside of comic book reader circles, was the excellent Phantom 2040, a highly acclaimed animated series airing in 1994 and 1995, which also saw a limited comic book series from Marvel, as well as video games released on the leading video game consoles of the time. But Phantom 2040 was cyberpunk, and tonally couldn't be further away from the original Phantom strips. Neither the few fans of the somber DC Phantom, or the numerous fans of the dystopian Phantom 2040, would have been in a rush to see the joyous and adventurous adaptation of Lee Falk's original Phantom, a Phantom they might not have been familiar with. Any fault here, of course, lies with the Phantom's owner, King Features, for failing to give American audiences access to the original Phantom stories, a situation which persists to this day. To further compound the situation, many have claimed that the movie's marketing campaign wasn't entirely up to scratch. Today, the only remains of the marketing campaign are some ads, the posters, and a trailer. But based on those, I can well believe the marketing as a whole to have been lacking. I'm a huge fan, and I was always put off by the official poster, although the one with the Skull Cave is okay. In what was a giant wasted opportunity, the studio actually commissioned the great Drew Struzan to make posters for the movie, but these were never completed. Only the sketches remain. The trailer is also a tonal mess of extreme colors, jokes, and Jerry Goldsmith's authoritarian Judge Dredd theme. Even in the 90s, it wasn't all that appealing. After the movie flopped in the US, Paramount cut back on promotion internationally, and even sent the movie direct to VHS in a number of territories. This was another boneheaded decision, because the countries where they skipped on the promotion included the ones where the Phantom actually had a strong following, such as the Nordic countries. In the end, Paramount had to take a huge write-off on the movie, and the two planned sequels were scrapped. It should be said, though, that the movie was a big seller on both VHS, Laserdisc, and DVD. Paramount more than made their money back in the end, even if it took a few more years to get there than they had wanted. To those who came in late, I am from the Nordic, one of the territories where the Phantom is the most popular. Back in 1996, when the movie came out, the Phantom was my favorite comic book hero. This was partially due to lack of choice, as he was pretty much the only comic book hero around. You see, the Nordic releases of the Marvel and DC titles kept on being cancelled left and right at this time. Mainly though, it was because the Phantom stories are simply awesome. When I saw the movie for that first time, way back in 1996, I found a lot to like in the Phantom, such as the music, the cinematography, and the bulk of the story. But there were things that bugged me about it, and precluded me from enjoying it as much as I would have liked to. First and foremost, I couldn't stand the Magic Skulls. To this date, they are my least favorite MacGuffins of all time. Secondly, 
I couldn't stand the intro, which I even then thought was cartoonish crap. There were other things I didn't mind too much, even if they did puzzle me. Such as, why was Bengala in Asia, when in the comics it was in Africa? Why was the Phantom so cheerful, even when facing his enemies? In the comics, he preyed on superstition and his own legend to scare the living daylights out of his enemies, in a way which would have made Batman jealous. And why did he show his face all the time? Like Judge Dredd, the reader never sees the Phantom's face in the comics. His eyes are always obscured by the mask, sunglasses or shade. Also, why was the movie set in 1938 and not in the modern day, as in the contemporary comics? And finally, why did it feel so much like the wannabe Indiana Jones movie instead of the grittier comics I was used to? Let's preface this retrospective by going back to the comics a bit. The era in which Phantom creator Lee Falk wrote the Phantom newspaper strip, the canon stories on which everything else is based, lasted from when he created the character in 1936 up until his death in 1999. This era can largely be divided into two parts, using the artists as separation. From 1936 to 1961, there was the Moore and McCoy years. Then, from 1961 to 1994, there followed the Cy Barry years, which you can also extend up to 1999, if you include the artists who filled in between Barry's retirement and Falk's death. This second period, the Cy Barry years, was a soft reboot of the first, updating the setting and the stories to the contemporary world, making it all a little bit edgier and the Phantom himself a little bit harder. These were the stories that Egmont expanded upon with gritty political thrillers set in contemporary Africa. These were the Phantom stories I, and everyone else of my generation, grew up with. Back in the 90s, these were the only Phantom stories available to us. Outside of the odd reprint Once in a Blue Moon, the older stories were nowhere to be found. Today, 20 years on, the picture is very different. Now, it is the Cy Barry era in general, and the gritty Egmont stories of the day in particular which are nowhere to be found. Although Egmont do keep on writing new stories, there are few collections of the stories from that time. By contrast, the original Phantom stories from the Moore and McCoy years have been reprinted and are easily available to readers worldwide. I wasn't familiar with these stories when the movie came out in 1996, but now having read many of them, I see the movie in a whole new light. The 1996 Phantom movie is an adaptation of the Moore and McCoy years. Or more specifically, it is an adaptation of the two very first Phantom stories ever published, The Sang Brotherhood and The Sky Band, by Lee Falk and Raymond Moore. In an age where other comic book movies either took bits and pieces from countless storylines and blended them together until only a washed out mess remained, or just made some crap up, the Phantom actually stuck fiercely true to its source material, years before that became the norm. Many of the things that puzzled me when I first saw the movie 20 years ago, I now see are straight from the original source material, even if it wasn't consistent with the comic book stories which happened to be in stores at the time of the movie's release. That's why Bengala was in Asia instead of Africa in the movie. In the original stories, Bengala was in Asia, and the stories all took place in the Far East. The movie takes place in 1938, because the stories it adapts takes place in 1938. Tonally, the movie feels like Indiana Jones because, like Indiana Jones, it also takes its cues from the adventure serials of the time the comic was made and the movie was set in. They showed the Phantom's face because Dread wasn't out yet. They still were of the belief that you needed to see the actor's eyes in order to relate. Speaking of which, I also have to give Billy Sane some long overdue props. While different from the Egmont Phantom of the 90s that I was used to, he nailed the personality and mannerisms of the Phantom as originally conceived by creator Lee Falk. The Phantom of the Moore and McCoy years was every bit as cheerful as Sane portrayed him in the movie. And why wouldn't he be cheerful? He's living an awesome, adventurous and fulfilling life, with a pet wolf and everything. Even so, he is serious when situation calls for it, 
just like in the original stories. Also, today we expect our superhero actors to hit the gym and develop the physique of the characters they portray. This was, however, not the norm at the time, when either a muscle suit did all the work for them, or the actor was cast because he already had the build necessary. Billy Sane, however, hit the gym hard and developed a frame identical to what the Phantom has in the comics, in an era when few others did. Beyond that, he also studied the Phantom's stance, movements and fighting style in the comic strip so he could replicate them in the movie. Looking back, Billy Sane was absolutely pitch perfect as the original Lee Falk and Raymond Moore Phantom. The movie is not without flaws. The intro is whack, the skulls are lame, Treat Williams goes way over the top to name the more glaring ones, which no doubt stem from the movie being written as a spoof. Beyond that, Salah's arc is a joke, and some of the visual effects are pretty badly out of date. But despite these flaws, there is a lot of good in the movie, which in many ways was ahead of its time. You have to keep in mind that it was released in 1996, the colorful dark age of comic book movies, the year after Judge Stallone and the year before Batman and Robin. Despite coming out of this era, the Phantom adapted its source material with a respect and approach that wouldn't become more common practice for another decade, well into the modern comic book boom. For this reason, the movie deserves more respect than it gets, and I don't think it should be dismissed as readily as it often is. For all the things it does wrong, it also does a lot right. If only there was a way to enjoy all the things the movie actually does get right without being distracted by the glaring flaws of 90s genre filmmaking. Well, there is. If you are a fan of The Phantom, and you are interested in an alternate take on the 1996 movie, and you already own said movie on Blu-ray or DVD, and you aren't allergic to black and white movies, then I have a recommendation for you. There is a subsection of the internet devoted to fan edits. These are movies that have been further tweaked by fans to highlight a certain aspect of a given movie, or to fix glaring mistakes in the official edit. Sometimes, these fan edits actually turn out better than the official version of the movie, Case in point, Brian De Palma considers Pete Geldeblom's fan edit of Racing Kane to be superior to his own theatrical cut of the movie. When Racing Kane was released on Blu-ray, De Palma saw to it that the fan edit was included with the release. Probably for publicity purposes, Geldeblom's fan edit was sold as the director's cut. In my opinion, The Phantom is another example of a movie made better by fan alterations. The fan editor Bionic Bob has made an alternate version of The Phantom called The Phantom Strikes. This version of the movie highlights everything good about it by cutting away most of the flaws of the theatrical version, such as the intro and the hallucination sequence where Kit talks with his dead dad. Also, there are numerous other tweaks throughout made to tighten the pace, fix continuity editors, and tone down Treat Williams. But when you watch this edit from start to finish, you'd never know anything was missing. The narrative is seamless and tighter than before. To top it off, this version of the movie is in black and white. There are three benefits to this. The first, and no doubt the intention of the editor, is that it brings the whole movie closer to the look and feel of the serials of the 30s and 40s, which the movie is inspired by. But a glorious side effect of removing the color is that these special effects that look cheesy and dated in the theatrical cut are spot on in black and white. Finally, the movie being in black and white brings it visually even closer to the comic strip, which was also printed in black and white. By removing the color, the phantom suit becomes grey, which is strangely appropriate. Before landing on the name The Phantom, creator Lee Falk considered calling the character the Grey Ghost, as he originally intended the suit to actually be grey, a color it is described as several times in the original stories. The official color wouldn't become purple until much later, which Lee Falk apparently wasn't thrilled about, and only in the US, Australia and some other territories. Different colors were chosen in other territories, 
In the Nordic countries, for instance, the suit has always been blue. The Phantom reverting to the grey ghost in this version of the film is a compromise fans from all over the world should be able to live with. Removing the intro sequence, which is replaced by more appropriate title cards, has the added bonus that the Phantom's origin story is merely hinted at before he reveals it himself towards the end of the movie. Which, by accident or design, is exactly how the Phantom's origin story was revealed in the first Phantom story which the movie is an adaptation of, The Sang Brotherhood. To get a hold of this version of the movie, first make sure you own a legally bought copy of the theatrical cut on Blu-ray or DVD, then head on over to fanedit.org and read up on the topic there. It is a bit of work, but if you're a fan, it's worth it because you will be left with the best adaptation of the Lee Falk and Raymond Moore era on film that is ever likely to be made. Let me know what you think of The Phantom, and if maybe you're willing to give it another shot in the comments. If you like this video, please hit that subscribe button. Join us for spin-free news and analysis of the happenings and corporate politics behind the scenes of your favorite genre movies, as well as explorations of your favorite characters and their backgrounds and context here at Midnight's Edge.